God's love, agape. But probably none better than 1 Corinthians 13. He really lays this out in a subject matter on spiritual gifts. You might think that was a strange place to stop and do one of the great passages on love. Uh, but if you study Paul's writings, you will find that all the passages on spiritual gifts, he talked about love. Every one of them. When you study 1 Corinthians 12, uh, we have it, 13. If you study Romans 12, he talks about it. If you talk uh, where the gifts are mentioned, if you, if you read uh, 1 Peter 4 where he talks about spiritual gifts, he talks about love. There's not a passage that you study spiritual gifts that he doesn't talk about love being a key motivating factor in ministry. Love. Love. So here we are in chapter 13 as most people, but what he's actually talking about is spiritual gifts. In the first three verses, he lists seven gifts. Be sure you, you, you know that. Uh, we will by the time the class is over. He talks about seven gifts in the first three verses. Uh, and, and he really talks about love in regard to their function, the motivating factor of the function of spiritually gifted ministries. <clears throat> Here's what he says. If I speak with tongues, he's talking about the gift, of men and angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong, and a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, that's three. And if I have faith, that was four. As to move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give another gift, if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and I, if I deliver my body, to be burned, but do not have love or proffer me nothing, there's another gift. It's not identified. It's identified by function. He lists seven. Do not miss this. Do not miss this, because you'll miss it if you're a casual reader of the Bible. The word if. The word if is used to designate sets of gifts. You'll miss it if you're not a serious student of the Word of God. So today we're going to take a look at this. Also notice that with each section of gifts, verse 1, 2, and 3, he issues a warning about the function of your gift not motivated by love. He issues a warning in verse 1, verse 2, and verse 3. Let's go back and look at it again. If I speak with tongues of men and angels and do not have love, a warning, and they do not function, I am not motivated by love in their function. Here's the danger. I have become a noisy gong. I've just become a gong show. You remember that? Many years ago, the gong show. In verse 2, he goes through other sets, the gift of prophecy, mysteries, knowledge, faith, but do not have love. That's a warning. I am nothing, the results of the warning. You just understand that? You understand what he's doing? He did in verse 1. He did in verse 2. Watch verse 3. If I give all my possessions to feed the poor, if I deliver my body to be burned, but do not have love, there's the warning, here's the results, it profits me nothing. Think about that. Think about that. That's a powerful. There is a lot of information in those three verses about your spiritual gift. Does every believer have a spiritual gift? Absolutely. You got it at the point of salvation by the Holy Spirit. 
chapter 12. We've already been through chapter 12. If you're not familiar with the study of spiritual gifts, go back and pick up our chapter 12. It would do you well to read it, to study it. Well, let's have a word of prayer, and we're going to get into the morning study. And here is the subject matter I want to emphasize with you. Love, that is God's agape love, is not a spiritual gift. Technically, talking about technical gifts, it is not a technical spiritual gift. It is a gift, and it is a gift of the, given by the Holy Spirit, but it's not technically a spiritual gift. A lot of people make the mistake because it's mentioned this way. Love is not a spiritual gift, technically, like the ones mentioned in here. He mentions seven gifts. Love is not one of those gifts. It's what motivates those gifts, okay? A lot of people make the mistake. They list, they list gifts, and they list love as a gift. It is a gift, but it's not technically a spiritual gift as we know gifts as listed by Paul. And he makes a point of that, does he not? Well, yeah. He makes a point of it. Um, so let's open with a word of prayer. Bible's a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality in your life is, could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue of hurt sins. That's carnality, evidence of carnality. What do I do? I confess that sin. It has nothing to do with my salvation. It has to do with my spirituality. When I confess my sin, I'm out of the flesh and back in the spirit. That's the work of Christ extended to the Christian life in regard to sin, personal sin, not a damning sin. You need to really learn that because your Christian life is not where it should be apart from you understanding how spirituality works in your life and how carnality is a danger to your spiritual life. Let's pray. I give you a moment in your priesthood of 1 Peter 2, 5, and 9 to take responsibility for confession of personal sin. To make confession so the Holy Spirit can teach you truth about your spiritual gift today and the importance of God's agape love function in it, the motivating factor behind it. Our Father, we thank you today for these who have come our way by the automobile and the internet to study with us. I pray the Holy Spirit once again would champion the cause of the word of God by teaching it to us and then recalling that and produce spiritual growth in us, especially in the subject of our spiritually gifted ministry, for we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Many writers who talk about 1 Corinthians 13, and it is a very popular book. More people have written on 1 Corinthians 13 than probably any single subject of the New Covenant doctrines. Agape love. Many have referred to it as the most beautiful chapter to be read on God's agape grace and yet the most difficult to live. Paul, once again, brings this subject matter of being motivated by God's love in the function of our gifted ministries. And he said if love is not the motiva motivation factor of it, then he issues warning, doesn't he? He issues warnings to you about it. So this is really important for us to understand. God's agape love is not a spiritual gift. Technically, it's not a spiritual gift. Let me show you. Turn in your Bibles to Romans 5, 5, 5. It is in Romans 5, 5 that we're told that the love of God is poured out into our hearts by the giving of the Holy Spirit. Do you notice that? Watch, it. Watch this now. He says hope does not disappoint because he's been in a whole discussion on that. Because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. You know, you may not realize some important factors. For example, the word poured out, 
ekleo. It is a perfect tense. It's a perfect tense. That means that something, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit in your life at the point of salvation is forever. Perfect tense means something completed in the past with the results in the present tense. In the present experiences of your life, it remains completed. This pouring out of the love of God into your heart by the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit was given to you, the eight works of the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit indwelt you, at the point that he regenerated you, he poured the love of God into your heart when you were given the Holy Spirit. Now, next week, when we talk about love, what it is and what it isn't, we'll talk about how regeneration is a very powerful idea. 2 Peter 1, 4 says, at the point of salvation, new birth, you must be born again. You get a divine nature. And love is what dominates that divine nature. See, a lot of people don't know they have a divine nature. You think that you have to do the things of God in the flesh rather than in the spirit. Nothing could be farther from the truth. You can do nothing for God in the flesh. Otherwise, unbelievers could do it. That's religion. That's not what Christianity is about. So, Romans 5.5 5 says that the love of God, God's agape love, is poured out in the perfect tense. It's a perfect passive indicative in that text, Romans 5.5. 5. Perfect tense. You've always, once he's poured, he's, it's always poured out into your heart. The love of God has been poured out in your heart. Will always be there. Will always be there. It will never be a day when it's removed from your heart. Not one day. Perfect tense. Passive voice. It was put there by the grace of God at the point of your salvation, the indignity of reality. That's a par par powerful idea. Okay, so you need to understand that it, you should be able to even see that in 1 Corinthians, the first three chapters, that love is the motive any factor. Where did that, when did that love, wh where was your first experience with that love of God? Point of salvation. When he entered your heart, when he entered your life, he poured out the love of God in your heart, and it will be continuous there. It will ne there will never be a day when the love of God is removed from your heart. Not one time, perfect tense. You've got to quit listening to people lie to you. Let the Bible teach you. Let the Bible teach you. God's agape love is a key to the function of spiritual gifts. That's the subject of 1 Corinthians 13. Spiritual gifts require the indwelling spiritual ministry of the Holy Spirit. That's why we have pneumatikos in the 12th chapter, verse 1. When he opens the subject, he says, gifts are all about the Holy Spirit. Spiritually, gifts are given by the Holy Spirit. Pneumatikos, chapter 12, verse 1. We have studied it in detail. Agape's love. Listen, is a, is a fruit in the Christian life. It's a fruit. Now, come on. If you've been to an average church, they have taught you Galatians 5, 22 and 23, or if you've been in a study group somewhere, they've probably taught you Galatians 5, 22, 23, nine fruit of the Spirit. It's not plural, it's singular. Fruit. doesn't say fruits. It says fruit. And the first one is listed is love. That's God's agape love. Do you already have it? Romans 5.5 5 says you have it. But it has to operate under the filling ministry of the spirit. It don't operate under the flesh. It operates under the spirit. You cannot artificially produce God's love by the flesh. If you, if you produce any love, it's human. It's not divine. 
God's agape love is divine love. It's supernaturally produced by the Holy Spirit. And it's called a fruit. A wonderful produce of the Holy Spirit. These are things that you must be aware of. So in that Galatians 5, 22, 23, fruit of the Holy Spirit, in verse 16, he tells you to walk in the Spirit, not the flesh. The things of the Spirit cannot be reproduced in the flesh. It's artificial. It's not supernatural. It's artificial. Okay? <laughs> Do you not know that? Paul would ask you today, how is it that you don't know that? It's very clear in the Bible because you've not been willing to put yourself under good study teaching of the Word of God. You need to change that in your life. You need to change it. Point number one. All four of the major passages on spiritual gifts connects God's agape love to the function of spiritual gifts. For example, when you read Romans, the 12th chapter, 3 through 9, there it is. When you read 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 13, boom, there it is. When you read Ephesians 4, 10 through 16, boom, there it is. When you read 1 Peter 4, 8 through 11, boom, there it is. These are all four major passages where spiritual gifts are discussed. These are the major passages on spiritual gifted ministries. You need to be good students of it because every church age believer has a spiritually gifted ministry to the church in the world. You need to know what your gift is. This is not a mystery. It's one of the clear Bible teachings. It, the only reason you don't know it is you don't study it. You've got to study the Word of God. You've got to study it. You've got to be students of it. And you've got to study it categorically. What does the Bible say about spiritual gifts? I've given you the four major passages. You should be strong students about it. This is not something you choose. This is something that's been chosen for you. Your spiritually gifted ministry has been chosen from you from eternity past. God knew you before you were even here. Think about that. He chose your gift to fit your very personality in life. Before you had a personality in life, this was chosen for you. Oh, I pray you understand that. All four passages. For example, in Romans, the 12th chapter, verse 3, let love be without hypocrisy. Don't be two-faced about your love. That's carnal. Love needs to be given with pure motivation. None of this hypocrisy. A lot of love. I could do a whole subject on love, hypocrisy. I mean, where the guy says to you, I love you. And then he wants all kinds of privileges without any responsibility from you. You go along with that. At some point, you got to wake up and quit that foolishness. That's hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is pre pretense love. It's not, it's not unconditional love for God that's expressed from your life to another person. It's carnal, carnal, carnal. Never settle for that type of love. It will burn you in the end. It will burn you good. Don't do that. And so Romans 12, he introduces that because if you know anything about Romans 12, you know verse 1 and 2. <clears throat> Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed. That's this passage. That's the introduction to spiritual gifts. 
Here's Romans 13, which we'll study in great detail, verses 1 through 8 and 13. In verse 13, but now faith, hope, and love. Now faith, hope, these are giant doctrines. These are enormous doctrines. Faith, hope, and love. And he says, love, of, love, love, faith, love, about these things, these three, but the greatest of these, these three exist, and they're major doctrines of the Christian faith. But the greatest of these is love. We're not talking about Coca-Cola love. We're not talking about Coca-Cola. We're talking about the love that comes from the cross of Jesus Christ, not Coca-Cola. Love that goes the world around business. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if I sold Coca-Cola, I would grab that theme. But I sell the cross. I'm about to cross, and that's the only place you're going to find the love of God. You're not going to find it in Coca-Cola. You're not going to find it in the world. I'm not, I'm not being paid for this ad with Coca-Cola. Here's Ephesians, the fourth chapter, 10 through 16, pulling out 15 and 16. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects unto him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, the church, being fitted and held together by whatever joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part spiritual gifts, causes the growth of the body for the edification or the building up of itself. Watch this, in love. I mean, what is the bottom, what is the bottom line when gear, gear, spiritual gifts function under spiritual gifted ministries function under the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the church? The church is edified by love. Isn't that interesting? Church is edified by love. Love. Yeah, that song, love. All I can get is a title. Here's 1 Peter 4, 8 through 11. Here's verse 8. Above all, above all else, above all, keep fervent. Keep fervent. Fervent is a powerful word in it. Fervent. Keep fervent. That's not lackadaisical. Fervent. That's on fire. Fervent. Keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sin. It doesn't create them. It covers it with the blood of Jesus Christ. What kind of love do you think covers a multitude of sin? Worldly love? Oh, no, it creates a world of sin. It creates a multitude of sin. But God's love that flows from the cross and the shed blood of Jesus Christ is what covers a multitude of sin when we're able to express that unconditionally to other people, to love others the way Christ loved us. To forgive others the way Christ forgave us. To be at peace with others as we're at peace with God. These are powerful ideas. Powerful ideas the church has forgotten about. Here's point number two. In 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3, we have characteristics by important phrases that must not be neglected. One of those phrases is, but do not have love. Notice in verse 1. Are you still? Are, let me go back. I'm in Romans. Let me go back to 13. See, a lot of times we read and don't read. Listen, when you read the Bible, pause enough time and have a word of prayer until it reads you. You've never done that. I look at your face now. You've never done that. Why is it you haven't done that? 
Well, you never thought of it before. Now you have. Listen to what it says. If I speak with tongues of men and of angels and do not have love, and do not have love, and do not have love, look at verse 2. If I have the gift of prophecy, know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith, so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, do not have love, look at verse 3. If I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I deliver my body to be burned, but do not have love, but do not have love, but do not have love. Think that's an important phrase to Paul? Do you think that this is a phrase of repetition that he's pounding upon your life? Repetition is how you learn. Repetition is how you learn. You go to school, you study 100, then they take you to 200, then they take you to 300, then they take you to 400, and when they get you to 500, you're now teaching 100. Right? <laughs> Repetition until you learn it, and then you're able to share it. but do not have love. There's a repetitious idea, a repetitious idea. And notice the word if. If it's connected with tongues. If I speak with tongues, boom. If, there it again, if I have the gift of prophecy and no mysteries. See, we have wisdom and knowledge in those two. If I have, if I have prophecy and I know mysteries, wisdom, and have knowledge, that's a set of gifts. And if I have, that's faith, not that comes from the Bible. This is supernatural, that I, God can speak to my heart. This, this is pre-canon period, that I could, God could say to me, pray for that mountain to be moved. God could reveal to me to do that extra biblical revelation in that period. I could speak to that mountain, and that mountain would be removed. That's a supernatural faith. That's not faith that comes from hearing, hearing the word of God out of the canon of Scripture. Well, let me repeat it to you. Yeah, I've never heard that before. I, I know I just, did I just read the Bible? I can't, I can't help it that you haven't heard that before because you haven't read the passage and paid any attention to it. So I read it again. Let's go back to faith. If, see, he's using if to, get, to set, to put gifts in sets. He's using if to put them in set. He, and he wants to put this one apart to tell you that I'm not talking about Romans 10, 17. This is a supernatural faith, a spiritually gifted faith. And he says, so as... This is a faith so as to remove mountains. This is not a Romans 10, 17 faith. This is a spiritual gifted ministry that was important when the new covenant was being developed and the church was being established in the world before the canon of scriptures that we call the New Testament. Did you notice that the if identified gifts? The first, it, verse 1, he identified the gift of tongues. In verse 2, he identified prophecy, wisdom, and knowledge as far as gifts. And then he set aside this word faith to show you that he's talking about a spiritual gift and not a spiritual function within your spiritual growth. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. He's not talking about that. He's not talking about faith comes by hearing and hearing the word. He's talking about faith that comes as a spiritually gifted minister, supernaturally by the Holy Spirit. And this was a pre canon gift. And then in verse th th 3, he says giving. And then he doesn't tell you the gift, but he uses the word if, and now you have to figure it out. If I deliver my body... 
to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. What gift is he talking about? He's talking about a communication gift, and probably it could be all the communication gifts as listed in Ephesians 4.11, but certainly he's referring to apostles. And I want you, I don't know if I wrote this, but be sure you write 1 Corinthians 4.9 down. Did I write it? I really help you people. <laughs> well, so let's look at that. I'm in 13, so let's go back to 4. Because this, he's talking about spiritual gift, and he's talking about martyrdom, is he not? Yes. He's talking about martyrdom. And martyrdom is going to come from the communicators. Other people are going to be swept into it. But the one, the, listen, the devil always goes after communicators to shut the mouth is to shut the information line. It's to cut communications. He always fights that way. Most warfares are fought that way. 4-9. For I think God has exhibited us as apostles, last of all, as men condemned to death, because we've become a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. That holds the subject matter of verses 1, 2, and 3. And so, for most of us, we know he's talking about apostles and could be talking about communicational gifts that are listed in Ephesians 4, 11. There are other passages that would tell us similar ideas on that. For example, I probably didn't write these down, but a similar idea is discussed by Paul in Romans 8, chapter, verse 35 and to the end. He talks about it in 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, 7 through 12, and his own personal experiences out of 2 Corinthians 11, 23 through 28. And he's emphasizing the... the the attack upon the communicating line, the teachers, the, the expositors of the Word of God, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastor, teacher. Note also the warning given in verse 1, 2, and 3 to these gifts. In regard to love, if, I, if, if my gift is not motivated within me to function on love, well, I'm not going to do it because I'm mad. I don't care whether they want, I'm not going to do it anyhow. My gift of helps is not going to help because I'm mad. They've mistreated me. Yes, but you have the gift of helps and they need help. I don't care. <laughs> They think they're going to treat me that way and then me turn around and give them supper. I give it to my dog first. Well, maybe that's not a good example because maybe you would give it to your dog first anyhow. But <laughs> I don't know. And the warning... Your gift must operate under, be motivated by love. That's supernatural. That's not flesh stuff. When flesh, when flesh begins to talk in the inner dialogue, well, you're not going to do that. I mean, how many times do they have to take you to the cleaners before you wake up? You know who's talking to you? Flesh. You'd have never got saved that way with the cross. He takes you just as you are. Come as you are without one plea. Christ died for me. We love to receive. We don't like to give it. We love love coming in, but we don't like going out. We're like the Dead Sea. I've become, I've become a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. If I function tongues without love, I'm a gong show. Two but do not have love. And he goes through a list of several. 
but do not have love, I am nothing. Is that not a powerful idea? I am nothing. He listed four gifts. He listed four gifts in verse 2. If they don't function in love, you are not to pick and choose. You are not to pick and choose. You are not to pick and choose. When the Holy Spirit reveals your gift and a need, that gift to function, you function it. You function it out of the unconditional love of God that saves you in your worst state of condition under Adam's sin. For God so loved the world that he gave his begotten son. What? But it don't flow from your life that way? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And that's how you received him. This is your worst day until Christ saved you. You were on your way to hell, not to heaven, because, listen, you could have sat in church and gone to hell. Because you didn't believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day, and it's upon that and that alone that your faith is able to save you by grace so that it's not of yourself, it's a gift. It's a gift. Point three. Out of 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3. Paul is teaching in these verses. Paul is teaching the importance of the doctrinal principle that God's agape love is the motivational factor of the function behind all spiritual gifted ministries. Let me show you what I mean. God's agape love was the motivational factor of God sending his son to be the savior of the world. The famous passage is John 3, 16, of course. This idea is also brought out by John in his writing of 1 John 4, 9, and 10. Well worth your read. Well worth your read. Also, agape love was a motivational factor of the Son who, was, who willingly became the sacrifice for the sins of the world. This is brought out in John, the 10th chapter, verse 17 and 18. In that, Jesus says some things that are really important for us. He said, I lay down my life so that I might take it up again. Now think about that. We know the story of Gethsemane. This is prior to that. And he says, I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. Now, we know what he means by lay down his life. I mean, he's going to have to go to the cross and die there for the sins of the world. This is, like not, this is not like going to the dentist with a toothache. I mean, this, this, is, this is tough. This is the Son of God. He who knew no sin became sin for us. In 2 Corinthians 5.21. And it's interesting. I lay down my life in order that I may take it up again. And he cuts back and he says, I lay it down on my own initiative. I have, listen to what he said now. He said, I have this authority. I have this authority from the Father. What authority is he talking about? I can lay it down or I don't have to lay it down. It's, and that, what's he talking about is volition. And he nailed it when in Gethsemane, when he, he says, not my will, but thy will be done, he laid it down. He said, the Father has given me the authority to choose. Therefore, it makes it more powerful when he says, I'm, I lay my life down. Who does he lay it down for? The Father. That I may, that I may take it up again. 
what's that? That's resurrection. And he took it up again for, for 40 days of post-resurrection appearances and back to the Father, seated at the right hand of God the Father, head of the church, Savior of the body, is where we are. Here's my point. What motivated the son to go to the cross and die this terrible death? Now, it's not terrible on our side, but it's terrible on his side. We get all the benefits of the judgment of sin on the positive side. He takes all that judgment. We get the, the blessings. He gets the cursing. We get the blessings. That doesn't seem like a fair trade, does it? He who knew no sin. And yet that's, that was the deal. So that we could be saved by grace through faith and not of ourselves, It'd be a gift. And what motivated that gift is the same that motivates ours. The love. The agape love of God. That unconditional love. The Father gave it to us and the Son gave it to us. Agape love must be the motivational factor, therefore, in the ministry of spiritual gifts. The Father motivated it. The Son motivated it. The gifts must, must be operate, operative by God's agape love. It's a supernatural love. It's not, you don't conjure it up. It's a gift in your, listen, Romans 5.5. 5. This love was given to you as a gift from God. His love that sent his son, his son that went to the cross, that love, the moment we believe the gospel of Christ, that very love that God had and that very love that the son had for our salvation becomes the positive part of that whole thing in us. The love of God is poured out shed abroad or poured out in the perfect tense of our heart along with the Holy Spirit. Through the Holy Spirit. That's a powerful idea. Therefore, our spiritually gifted ministries that we all have are to be motivated by love. We lay down our life. We lay down our life that love may... Be the gift that keeps on giving. Jesus laid his life down. Now, what does that mean? He gave up all of his wishes and ambitions and aspirations of life for the Father. I mean, what does it mean to lay your life down? It has to be motivated, right? It's not to bribe God or to coax him into something you want. It comes from an inner working of your attitude towards God and, and what God has provided for your life under the principle of grace. This is a love that operates by grace and not whether you feel about like it or, or got attitudes about it. I gave you other scriptures that have been well worth your time to read on re regard to agape love. Agape love must be a motivational factor in the spiritual gifts of ministry. Listen to this. In 1 Corinthians 14, 1, he's going to come off this great chapter on love in regard to spiritually gifted ministry. And you know what he's going to say? In chapter 14, verse 1, he's going to say, pursue love. He's going to say to pursue it. Now, if you're single, or if you just recently got married within a year, how long have you guys been married? Who's counting, right? Almost three. Gosh, it doesn't seem possible. Well, look, you pursue somebody until they catch you. You do know that's how it works, don't you?
Here's the problem with that. If the right motivation of the pursuit is not there, after you catch the prey, <laughs> there's no more pursuing. That's not how God's work. You're always pursuing even after you catch. Always pursuing love. I hear people come into marital counseling who've been married 20 years and they go like, we've just, we've just grown apart. You want to grow back together? Well, we're not quite sure. Well, there's your problem. I just thought I'd ask it. It's not optional. You're married. You're both believers and you're married. So how are you going to fix it? We're going to take that option. I don't know if I want to fix it. We're going to take that off the table because it's not optional. So let's stop focusing on how we're going to get rid of one another and figure out how we're going to put this thing back together. You understand a different attitude is required for that? I very seldom get a second counseling session unless they really want to fix it. If they do, we can. 100% guaranteed fix. What have they ha what's happened in their life is they stop pursuing love. I've been married 60 years. And God has taught me to pursue love. Not outside the home. <laughs> inside it. Not outside my marriage. Inside my marriage. And he had to teach me that. Because I pursued by worldly ways. And God taught me to do it his way. And there's a world of difference. I should never hear you come into my counseling sessions. We've grown out of love. Paul said you must pursue it. Pursue is a strong word, isn't it? You pursue it. You're chasing it down. It's a powerful idea. It's the idea of pursue. Pursue love, yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts. Here's number four. Spiritual gifts are divinely designed to function as an expression of God's agape love. Watch this now. I want you to underline this on your paper. Based, and here's why, here's how love works. On the basis of the character one with the gift and not on the one receiving the ministry of the gift. Did you get that? Pursue love with the function of your gift. A really a really neat idea. And this is 1 Corinthians. It should be not 3, but 13 on your paper. 13, 1 through 8 and 13. Spiritual gifts must function under the filling ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5, 8. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's not an indwelling. That's a filling. That's giving the Holy Spirit great opportunity to exercise his responsibility with your gift. We just studied 1 Corinthians 12, 4, ministry of the Holy Spirit. 5, ministry of the Lord. 6, the ministry of God. All connected, the Godhead, all connected with your spiritual gift. 
all members of the Godhead connected with the spiritual gift. That's really important. You understand as you go deeper into this, in Galatians 5, 16, 17, you're told to walk by the filling ministry of the Holy Spirit. You're told to walk in the filling ministry of the Holy Spirit where He is capable of doing everything you're incapable of doing. And even if you feel you're capable of doing, you're supposed to set aside your ability to allow Him to do what his job is, therefore walking by the filling ministry of the Holy Spirit. A lot of times, we don't look to the Holy Spirit to do it because we know we can do it ourselves. You should always look to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You have God, the third person, the third member of the Godhead, there to exercise in its complete responsibility your gift. Your spiritual gift does not function in carnality. That really is 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3. Pneumatikos. In chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, verse 1, when he says spiritual gifts. Pneumatikos. The word spirituality means spirit, y'all. The word is spirit. Everything is about the indwelling Holy Spirit. You're given the gift. He distributes it to you. It's the power he has to manifest it. God is responsible to, responsible to the program within the body of Christ. The effect or the performance of how it operates in the greater plan of God. These are powerful ideas that Paul is discussing with us. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. We say it all the time around here. Listen to 1 Corinthians 13, 11. We'll get to later. When I was a later meaning another week. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. And that was normal. That's normal, isn't it? Not for a child. But it's not for a, an adult. It's not reasonable as an adult. He says, when I became a man, spiritually mature, I did away with childish things. This is in a passage dealing with spiritual gifts. Chapter 13. The people were having... Immature thinking about spiritual gifts. It was affecting their relationship within the church. There was division and quarreling, uh, strife that he talks about in chapter 1 of Corinthians. I did away with childish things means Ephesians 4, 22, 23. It means to put them off and put on the right thinking. Put off childish thinking, put on mature thinking. That's Ephesians 4, put off the old man, put on the new man. That's what he's talking about. I did away with childish things. Can't do away with them if you don't acknowledge them and do something about it. I put them off. You put off childish thinking, you put on mature thinking. 1 Corinthians 14, 20, brethren, do not be childish in your thinking, yet in evil be infants, but in your thinking be mature. You know what he's talking about? Spiritual gifts. Isn't that interesting? We're in chapter 14. Talking about spiritual gifts. Point number five. In 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, Paul is teaching that God's agape love is the par excellent way for spiritual gifts to function in order to edify the church body. The function of gifts edify the church body. It's what makes us a healthy church. A healthy church is one where the membership understands and, and manifests the, the ministries of spiritual gifts. 
this is the theme of these passages, like, like this, 1 Corinthians 12, 31, 13, 13, 14, 1, and 40. When you look at these passages, they're dynamite. The end of chapter 12, the end of chapter 3, and then chapter 4 is making mention of that. You will need to stay engaged in all of our studies, chapter 12, 13, and 14, in order to get the questions that you have answered. I know you have a lot of questions, and we'll stir up more. If you still have questions after we go through 12, 13, and 14, come and see me. Don't come and see me until we go through the whole exercise. You've studied chapter 12 with me. You've studied chapter 13 with me. You study chapter 14 with me because I'm going to try to answer all your questions. If I don't get them answered, then come to me and I'll get them answered. I'll bring them back to the congregation. You can go to my website. I teach this every year. I teach on spiritual gifts. And every year is different. God just gives me insight into other things. But I, I imagine we've about, about answered every question under the sun. The Corinthian church was aware of the importance of spiritually gifted ministries, yet the function of these gifts were hindered by a lack of God's agape love through the indwelling Holy Spirit. They were having problems. And it, and it was the function. They, it wasn't, they wasn't being motivated by God's love. They were, it was causing, they were, they were self-centered. They were picking and choosing who they were gonna, their ministry was going to work to. You don't get to pick and choose. God picks and chooses. The whole, the whole God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are all involved in the function of your ministry to edify the church, not to edify you, not to give you points with people. It's for the body of Christ. It edifies the whole church. And when the church is edified, the love of God is manifested through the exercise. This is what we find in 1 Corinthians 1, 7, 12, 25, and 13, 1 through 8. Next week, we're going to talk about what love is and what love isn't. And we're talking about the difference between God's love and the world's love. God's love and the world love. Divine love and diabolic love. We'll see that next week when we study on God's love. Spiritual gifts should operate within the church body, even under the most difficult circumstances and suffering for Christ. You can read about this in Romans 12, 9 through 21. We'll study it in 1 Corinthians 13 and 14. Ephesians 4. I put all this on your paper for you, so you might take a look at this. Your motivating factor of the function of your gift is the love. Love other people unconditionally. You love others the way God loved you and sent his son, the way the son went to the cross for you. You love other people. and You love them unconditionally. They don't have to change for you to love them. See, that's why people get divorced. Christians shouldn't do that. You're supposed to love them unconditionally. You know that's what agape love is, unconditional love. You know it. You talk about it. Yet when it knocks on your door, you abandon that idea and, and go to, conditional condi to, to conditions. I'm going to love under the following conditions. He's not going to do that to me and think he can get away with it. Yada, yada, yada. Or vice versa. You do know that, don't you? Listen, as I close, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. Beloved children, we're the maximum object of God. Listen, we're the object of God's maximum love. We're the object of God's maximum love. We're called beloved children. God loves us with all of his heart, with all of his soul, and with all of his strength. That's how we're to love other people. Not only are we to love God that way, love God with all your heart, with all your but we're to love other people the same way, unconditionally. 
with all of it, not some of it, all of it. Why are you holding some back? When you hold some back, you've destroyed agape love. Be imitators of God as beloved children. Walk in love. How do I imitate God? I walk in love. See that? Be imitators of God. Well, Ron, how, how in the world could you ever be an imitator of God? Walk in his love. That's our whole subject today, walk in his love. Walk in his love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us and offering a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Not a sacrifice to myself, not a sacrifice to somebody else, but a sacrifice to God, a fragrant aroma. Well, thank you for staying. Next week we're going to take a look at the difference between divine love and diabolic love. The, the love that God has and the love the world tells you they have. The substitute. So he's going to tell you what love is and what love is not. All right? So. You love God and like Coke. Okay. Not vice versa. Let us pray. Well, our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way by the automobile and the Internet to study with us. I pray, Father, the Holy Spirit has ministered the truth. A lot of subject matter here on spiritual gifts. We covered three verses, and they were dynamite. It's just absolute dynamite for the rest of the chapter of 13 and 14. Uh, Paul does that. We're so thankful the way Paul wrote, Father. It takes students of the word, though. You're not going to get Paul with a casual attitude. And Peter says, well, you've got to put your thinking cap on when you study Paul. But when you do, you find just a masterful way of establishing principles, building doctrine upon doctrine, precept upon precept. Just a phenomenal way of study. I pray, Father, today, the Holy Spirit would minister to us in the Word of God, the importance of our spiritual gift and how the motivational factor behind it is God's agape love. And without it, it profits me nothing. I am nothing with my gift if, that, if I'm not motivated by it. It's strong. That's very strong because it involves the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love. And the maturity of the soul is love. And so... We're thankful for this. Encourage our hearts, Father. We're a church that believes in the ministry of the church through spiritual gifts. We have put our entire foundational structure upon it. We believe it's, a, we believe it's New Testament. We believe it's the foundational thinking of the, of the Christian church. We've put our, all of our eggs in one basket, so to speak, because we believe that. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.